but welcome. And thank, thank you, you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to join us for one of our um, daily chats. So as people know, people don't know you're a two-time Olympian, have been at the top of the tree for the last probably 10 years with I am and Turner Freestyle. So tell us what's life like in Australia at the moment. Are you in the same situation with us with, with lockdown? Uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me, Peter. I uh, appreciate um, you guys taking the time for me to speak to you guys. Um, here in Australia, it's pretty, it's pretty good at the moment. We're on um, restricted sort of movement, only essential travel only around, I know, in Queensland, southeast Queensland. That's where I'm based. So um, it's about 28 degrees here today. So it's, it's a great day, but we can't really go out and do too much. So um, just trying to stay busy and, and trying to stay um, motivated as best as possible. So tell us about your week at the moment. I know Bolly has been trying to get you guys together. How's your week panning at the moment? I think it's very important um, in these situations. Uh, and that's what I've really made a point of doing is just, is, is just getting in a routine, um, whether that might be getting up and going for a walk each morning and then um, coming home and then maybe getting on the bike and then doing some gym at home. I think it's just important to establish some good routines um, for the entire week. I think if we, you know, we can laze out of bed and, and you know, not feel motivated to go and do anything or get active and, and load those sorts of things, I think it can be detrimental um, to, to your health and mental health and physical health as well. So I'm just trying to stay busy and, and, and try and find things to do and, and just try and um, wait out what's going on, I guess, because, you know, I haven't seen anything like this and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people haven't been in these times. Yeah, that's very true, Tom. We are just chatting before about how you're using this time to work on visualisation and, and things yeah. like that. Can you just expand on that? I think that's a really good point that you, that we really haven't touched on over here very much so far. Um, this is a great opportunity to visualise where you want to go, you know, what you want to do, so forth, so on. Yeah, I think I was just chatting before about visualisation. I think as well as the physical and, and mental side of it, I think it's really important just to take time to um, just to visualise, you know, for me, I, I've been trying to work on um, just taking that, you know, five minutes a day where I'm visualising, maybe it's, you know, I'm trying to get better at my underwater kicks and my turns and my push-offs. So I've just been going, trying to get a bit of a routine of trying to visualise some of those, what I envision my underwater kicks to look like. Um, and then in turn, what I, how I want to come off the wall when, I, when I'm in training and racing, those, those types of things. So I think as well as the physical conditioning, I think, we can use this time for a bit of visualization and that's just not for sport. I think if you're studying or if in your work life and you can't work in your normal environment, I think it's good to um, visualize, you know, some positive thoughts of, you know, what you envision your life to be when you go back to work or you go back to your, to your daily environment. I think um, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to be said about that space. So I encourage some people to, to try it and, you know, I'm sure you can go on YouTube and, get some good visualization techniques and um, just have, have a go and, and you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, we had a good um, lecture yesterday on one of the top mind trainers um, in um, India and that was very insightful and it was a great learning curve. Now, before yeah. you and I were discussing, just a minute ago, we were discussing routines. I think yeah. it's really important to stay in a routine. Yeah, as a swimmer, you know, you're up early mornings, you've got a routine, up morning train, breakfast school or university or work. <laughs> yep. yeah, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to emphasize to everyone on my team that even though we're on break, we still try and keep in that routine. It doesn't have to be as rigid as it was when you're training ten times a week, but it's important yep. to get into that routine of getting up early in the morning, doing your session, getting your schoolwork done or doing what you have to do during the day. Yeah, trying to get a routine because there's nothing worse than having a long break and trying to get back into yeah, a sport. Oh, absolutely. I think and I've I've found for myself that if I just sit around all day and I, you know, just watch TV or sit on the couch, I feel even more tired than if I was to go out and swim two sessions and do a gym session and be busy all day. I, I feel quite, you know, energized and enthusiastic from, from that sort of routine. But if I, I feel if I, if I sit on the couch and, and I'm not productive with, you know, my physical health and my mental health, I, I, I feel a little bit worse. So 
I think as we, as I was explaining before, just getting in a routine, whether that's getting up and, and making a breakfast and then cleaning the house or, you know, getting up and doing some homework or some study first thing in the morning and then you have some lunch and then you go and do some exercise. I think it's just really important to establish a routine so you're not sort of lost in the day or lost in the weeks and the months that who knows how long this might go on for. And I think just being comfortable in that routine is is, is very important. That's very true, Tom. Very yeah. well said. Now, let's go back to the start because you've been, you've been – at the pointy end, like, like your Commonwealth Games gold medalist, Olympic finalist, two-time Olympian, World Championship gold medal winner, you've done it all. Um, tell us back, uh, take us back to the Newcastle day. Um, how'd you get started, and what age did you start at? And then tell us what year you moved to Dennis, and then we can go from there. Yeah, so I have a, um, I guess not a typical story of of my um, initial swimming years. I I didn't really enjoy swimming when I was at a, at a very young age. I, both my, my parents, my mother and my father were very keen swimmers and they were swimming every morning. And then uh, my older sister was, was, fought, was going along to do swimming lessons. So then the youngest member of the family, which was me, had to go along and do swimming lessons just so I couldn't stay at home alone. So I was kind of, um, I guess, pushed into the into the swimming world to stay fit and learn how to swim because it's such an important part here in Australia growing up is to be able to learn how to swim. And once I sort of found my feet in the pool and I um, got a little bit older and I started to enjoy it a bit more because I had all my friends and um, I could see my times coming down um, just from attendance, just, you know, not doing anything really specific when I was, when I was younger, I was just, you know, turning up to my, six or seven sessions a week when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14. And it just, just that natural progression of improvement just from attendance and turning up to training was, was enough for me to want to see where I could take the sport when I was that 14, 15, 16 years of age. Um, I still remember going to my first national age when I was 13, 13 years of age. And I, I came absolutely dead last in the 200 freestyle and the 400 freestyle. Um, but that made me come back for the next year and win a couple of age, um, individual medals. So I think at that young age, just from, um, attending training and attending training to have fun with my friends and just enjoying the sport, I had that natural progression. And then when I was 16, I actually got a scholarship to the Australian Institute of Sport to train under Vince Rally. So I, I moved to Canberra. I moved out of home when I was 16 um, to go and chase my swimming career. Um, and, uh, yeah, I essentially went down to um, Canberra, which is about six-hour drive from where I, I was living in Newcastle, um, and spent two years there to develop um, my swimming career, some skills. And then when I was 18, I, and then I uh, made the decision to move to the Gold Coast, where I, I currently live now, and I have been living for the past 10 years to, to train under Dennis Cottrell and, um, where I had, you know, had great results and great time. Now, you, you've, you probably, um, people don't know, you moved to Dennis Cottrell as an 18-year-old. Uh, yep. Dennis is well, world-renowned as a coach. You know, coach Grant Hacker, two, two Olympic gold medals, um, was very much in the corner of Sun Yang when he was training. It's, it's coached numerous Olympians, um, absolutely world-renowned. Tell us about the absolute, because you and I know Dennis really well, He's a yeah. different – tell us what it's like to arrive at Dennis Cottrell's program and the man works at – the man is very demanding and very intense. Tell us what it's yeah. like to train Dennis. I mean, when I went and trialled there for two weeks um, prior before moving there and after the first week of training, I didn't need the second week. I was I, – I said to Dennis, look, I'm coming here. There's, you know, there's, there's no ifs or buts. I'm, I'm moving here. And as you mentioned, I was 18 and I, and I sort of formed the relationship with Dennis because I was moving to the Gold Coast on my own. I, I sort of um, looked at Dennis as my, my second father. He was, you know, took me in and taught me, every, taught me a lot of things in life, not just in the pool, but in life. And um, if I had known what type of training that I was in for, I, I probably would have second guessed, but... 
Um, Dennis is very um, specific in his training. It might seem very crazy on the outside looking in, but there is definitely a method to his madness. And I think his results over the years were, were very, um, you know, just proves that. Um, I'll say it's not for everyone, that program. Um, Dennis is not for everyone, but he was, for me, he was the perfect coach for me at that point in my career. So, um, I mean, some of the sets would, we did in training would probably blow a lot of people's hair backs and think, you know, how can that be possibly written up on a whiteboard day after day, session after session? Um, but I don't know, I just really clicked with Dennis and I, and I after that first trial, I just sort of... Um, yeah, just just grew a connection with Dennis, and and we and we went on to achieve great things together. Yeah, Dennis is certainly a, a different cat. Um, yeah. yeah, Dennis and I are, are good friends, as you know, and I find him um, yeah extremely interesting. Um, as you said, it's not everyone's coach type of coach, but I think it's important that swimmers have a relationship with their coach so they can feel that they can talk to him about things or or her, but also understand that there's you know, certain you know, guidelines and training and on pool deck, he's the boss and, and you're a student, but outside the pool, uh, you can still talk to your coach about um, about different personal things or different problems you may have going on in your life. And Dennis yeah, is that type of guy, isn't he? Absolutely. You know, there's been many occasions in my swimming career where, um, you know, some outside factors really were bothering me. And, um, you know, I always knew that I could go into training and, and be able to talk to Dennis and, by the end of the conversation, he would somehow, you know, in some of the most crazy situations, be able to make sense of it and put put me at ease, basically, and and be able to talk. You know, I think there's a there's a there's a there's a big thing to you know that a coach can or can one thing train you and get the best out of you in the pool, but it's another thing to connect with you on an emotional level and be able to just really understand you and understand where you're coming from and your point of view. And I think with me and Dennis, that's probably where we clicked um, was that his terminology and his rationale behind things just really clicked with me. And I just found myself very comfortable talking with him about not just swimming and, and racing competitions, but also other stuff outside the pool. So um, yeah, we ha we had a great relationship and we still do to this day. You know, I spoke to him, last week for about an hour and a half on the phone. So, um, yeah. Yeah, with well, Dennis is a different kettle of fish. You can go for a cup of coffee and it ends up being two and a half hours. So that's, yeah, that's a top exactly. five years. You're either Dennis Cottrell <laughs> fan, another Dennis Cottrell fan. Now, that's right. <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's definitely, um, I've known him for probably 25 years, 30 years, and he's always always helped me with my ideas, helped me with my coaching career a lot. So I appreciate yep. what he's done for me. Now, yeah. You're two-time Olympian, so you've done it all. You know, Olympic finalist, Commonwealth Games gold medalist, you know, world championship medalist. Um, what keeps you going? I think what keeps me going is, at you know, I'm 28 years of age now, and I've I've been on the international scene for almost 10 years, or for over 10 years now. I think what keeps me going is, or I know what keeps me going is 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 still I got I still have goals that I want to achieve. I still want to. Um, you know, the biggest goal for me right now is to help get the Australian men's 4 by 2 freestyle relay on top of the podium um, at the 2021 now Games. So um, that is a huge motivating factor for me and probably something that still keeps me going um, now. So I think just after each season, it's very important just to, one, reevaluate the season that's just gone and your goals that you achieved or didn't achieve. And then being able to determine new goals and, and new um, standards for the next season. It's going to be different every year. Some, some seasons might be um, results driven. Some might be school driven. I think it's just important um, to find that why every season. And for me, the why for me is, you know, like I said before, is helping the men's team for Australia get on, on that number one dice when that Olympics comes around. That's very true. I'd love to answer there, Tom, where you said that you've got to have a purpose. You know? doesn't mean you've got to win, yeah. you know, make Olympic teams. It could be just swimming personal best or attendance of training or effort of training, whatever the case may be. But you've got to have a plan. Yeah. 
can't just swim around like a goldfish every day. You've got to have clear goals where you want to achieve and have a long-term goal to be an Olympian. That's great. But then have short-term goals and tick them off. Yeah, and I think it's very important to, to know as well that just because you're not at that Olympic level doesn't mean you can't have goals. You know, I think everyone in every walk of life should have some sort of goal, whether that's, you know, the person, the kid in primary school or, you know, the Olympic gold medalist going for another Olympic gold medal. I think it's just in, it's very important to know that if you're not at that high achieving level, you can still have goals. And I think it's very important to have goals um, no matter what walk, walk of life you come from. And, and just having, as you said, Peter, having that, that purpose, you know, have that purpose of, as we were talking about before, the routine in the morning, having that purpose of, I'm going to make breakfast this morning because I want to make the best breakfast I possibly can. And then I want to go do the laundry the best I possibly can. Just have, just have reason why you do things and you'll find once you set, set a goal or set a purpose on things that things become more enjoyable as well. You're not just doing them for the sake of doing them. Um, yeah. That's how I think anyway. <laughs> that's exactly the way I, I, I go through life as well. I do think at 110%. It doesn't mean I'm always going to be successful, but unless you give your best, you're never going to know. I think that's really exactly. important. I know my fellow coaches at Glenmark are like that also, and I would say most of my squad are like that as well. Now, Tom, you are a world-class 200 freestyle and a world-class 200 IM swimmer, or 400 IM swimmer. You've been 145 for the 200 free. You've been 157 for the 200 IM. You've been 346 for the 400 free. You've been 410 for the 400 IM. Um, have, being a 200 freestyle and a 400 IM up, and both these like a world class you know, world class swims. How do you split up your week with bowling, training wise? Um, that's that's a very good question. It's something that we've had to juggle. Even going back to the days with with Dennis, I, it's something that we had to juggle, um, and making sure that all your bases are covered. And I think, especially swimming the medley, you have to you can in two thousand and twenty you cannot have a weak stroke um, on the international level. I think maybe 10 years ago, you could have had a, had a weak, weaker stroke, but these days you, you just can't have a weak stroke. And, you know, the only way around that is just doing the work in each stroke. That's, that's what it comes down to is, is being competent in all, all four strokes at an international level that when I was swimming the 400 IM, my goal was to get my four individual stroke, 200 meter times as fast as I possibly could. So to get my 200 meter fire time down, my 200 meter backstroke, my 200 free breaststroke, my 200 meter freestyle times down as fast as I possibly could, which would help my 400 IM. So in going back to the training week, I think it was just if, you know, if people had two sets of, of the main set, I would end up doing it four times because I had to do it one of each stroke. Um, and just being able to have that mix of a good background in conditioning, but also having an element of speed and having a, you know, that, that little top end type speed. So there's a lot of things to think about and consider and also juggle at the same time. But I think in some sort of way, they all marry up and they all sort of train the same energy system, which helps, but to get, you know, to the to the top of the top of the tree, you have to be really specific in each individual stroke, which just takes time and um, time under load and 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 all those those good analogies and and sessions and um, so in the simple answer, it's just a juggling act, but a lot of specificity in in, in what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. You touch on a thing there, which. I try to get through to our squad. Well, I think most coaches are about the ability to change gears, to go up a gear when you need to go up that gear, and the yep. ability to you know, push push that out, extra hard set when you need to do a sprint set. Even though you're 400 IM swimmer, you still need to do your sprint sets at a high intensity, and vice versa. Sprinters also need to do a bit of aerobic work and a bit of hard yards. Absolutely. I think I'm a big believer in whether you're a 100-meter 100, 100 swimmer or a 1,500-meter swimmer, you have to be able to swim through gears you have to be able to change gears um 
and I, I'm a I'm a big believer in that as well. So um, just a lot of lot of uh, specific type work that you got to do in each stroke, but you know that's the the yeah. price we pay, I guess. Well, I was very summer. lucky that um, I had the opportunity to work with you guys for ten weeks um, when Dennis was overseas back in 2015. So when I walked in the first day, there was yourself, uh, Grant Hackett, two-time Olympic gold medalist, um, Daniel Smith, Olympian, Lauren Boyle, Olympian, um, Jordy Harrison, sub-15, um, yep. 15 years freestyle. So it was quite an imposing squad. But what I found really interesting was that you guys are quite chatty and quite easygoing in warm-up and you're very, you're very relaxed and have a good time. When it comes to main set, the intensity was just extreme. Like you guys trained at a thousand miles per hour. Um, sledging was very much part of the program, and <laughs> you pushed yourselves to extremes. And you demanded you, you demanded from your teammates that go as hard as you, and you demanded from yourself to be the best you could be, and you demanded from the coach also that you want him to give you hundred ten percent. And I found that very interesting. It's, it's probably the first program I've been to where the intensity was just so... And then after the main set, when you got onto secondary sets, there was still the intensity, but it was just back to normal. You guys are just normal, everyday guys. Yep. Yeah, I think that's, that's something that, you know, just doesn't come overnight. I think we just had a really good core group of people that all had similar things in common and similar personalities. And I think when it comes down to it, we all had a great respect for our teammates and we all wanted each other to swim well, whether it was me and Grant that were swimming the 200 meter freestyle against each other or Geordie in the 1500 or Lauren and Michelle that were there. We wanted everyone just to swim fast and we didn't want, we didn't want anyone in the squad that was, you know, not putting in a hundred percent. And that was just one of our mantras that, we always gave a hundred percent, no matter if you were sore and tired and you were swimming two seconds off the time you were meant to be going, that wasn't really relevant. It was just about the effort that we were putting in. And when it came time, I think you made a really good point that I think it's really important as swimmers that we spend a lot of time doing, you know, kilometer after kilometer. I think it's very important to learn the skill of being able to turn on and turn off. And I think that's what we did really well is, you know, when we're in the clubhouse stretching before training, it was very lighthearted. It was, you know, kind of joking around and in the warm up got a little bit more serious. But then when the main set started for that, you know, 30 to 45 minutes of the main set, we, we were, you know, this is race mode. This is, you know, race specific. This is what we need to bring to the race every time we compete. So I think it, it was just an unspoken thing that we, we just expected of each other. And I think once you get a core group of people um, that have like-minded thinking and have the same goals in common, I think, <clears throat> well, I personally believe that culture drives itself. And um, it, it was really cool to be a part of because you couldn't, you couldn't get, not that you want to get away with anything, but when you were kind of sore and tired and, and didn't really want to show up mentally or physically, you know, Jordy could be on, he could be swimming the house down. So you were thinking, oh, well, I can't let the team down. I've got to go, you know, like regardless of what I'm feeling, I've just got to go. So yeah. I think that was, that was a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the mantra and, and the thought behind it all. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't personal, which I really loved about the squad. I mean, you guys went hammer and tong and it got quite, um, quite chatty in times. It was, it was very interesting to watch you and Grant and Jordy and yeah. Daniel head to head to head. And the girls weren't missed out either. Like the girls were very intense also. And that's what I loved about being there for that 10 weeks. It was just, I learned so yeah. much from you guys. Weeks. Just, I learned from you guys and, and, and hopefully you learned from me as well. Now, yeah. next question. You had the opportunity to race the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Michael Phelps. You've been, <laughs> you've probably raced him more times than anyone else in Australia in, in turn of freestyle, 400 IM, 10 IM. Just happened to pick the events he was good at. <laughs> Tell us what it's like to race Michael Phelps and why do you think he is so good? Um, well, that's a pretty tough question. I think, you know, just from the dealings that I have with Michael, I think he's just a very driven 
um, driven person and motivated person as you know, we all are in swimming and you know, we're, I'm a big believer in we all motivated about motivated about something in life, but with Michael, it was just, you could just see that he had that, those goals and he wasn't, he was uncompromising in the way that he went around and he, he wasn't, he wasn't um, going to go out of his way for anyone if it got in the way of his goal. And I, that's something that I really admire. I have a, a little story about the first time that I raced Michael. It was at the 2010 Pacific uh, Pan Pacific Championships in in California, which is, as you know, Peter is the Pampax is you know a pretty big event for Australians, and because yep. you know the time we get to go up against the Americans. And I think I was just turned 18 at the time, and I was I was I think it was maybe day one or day two, and I was leading off the four by two freestyle relay. And Michael was leading off the relay as well. And he was, USA was in lane four and, and Australia was in lane five. And I think Japan was in lane three and in the outside lane was South Africa or something like that. I can't really remember, but I remember thinking, you know what, I'm just, Michael's leading off. He's obviously my men, my, my hero, you know, the best ever. He just won eight gold medals at the most recent Olympics. I'm just going to go and just try and keep up with him for as long as possible. So I dove in. First 50 metres was going great. I was, you know, I was kind of with him. And then the 100 metre mark, I was kind of shocked because I was still with him. And then being the inexperienced, you know, rookie swimmer that I probably was at the time, at the 100 metre turn, I was so excited that I was next to him and I didn't think I'd be able to keep up with him for 100 metres. I, I completely missed the 100 metre wall. And then I missed the wall and then I had to essentially do a dead start at the 100 metre turn. Um, of the 200 meter freestyle and I, and I turned and missed the wall and I was in my streamline and I just saw Michael with one of his trademark underwater kicks to, to 15 meters and that was all over from there. So that was something that I look back on and, and you know, as a young 17, 18 year old kid wanting to take on probably arguably the best swimmer of all time, um, come off second best. But I think that that comes back to being able to nail a race plan and focus on your own own race plan. But I don't know. That's just one of the memories that I have um, of my first time racing Michael. So yeah. it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's a pretty cool story, Tom. Um, yeah. I was, actually, I was watching the Michael Jordan special last night and he's a yeah. bit like Michael Phelps. Does not take prisoners, does not accept second best. The man is extremely driven and that's why they're yeah. the best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've I've watched that documentary as well, and you can you can definitely see um, similarities between those two, and you know that's why he you know that's why he's won twenty three gold medals at the Olympics is because you know he put in the work, he wasn't willing to compromise on his goals, and he was consistent day in day out. I think from one of the stories was from two thousand and four two thousand and eight, he didn't take one day off in four yeah, years. I heard that too, yeah. uh, I, so, I heard him. Four sessions in four years. That's what I heard. Yeah, it's it's just you know Scary. that's commitment. Yeah, that's commitment it. to a goal. That's, that's exactly right. That's exa and that's what you have to be if you if you're the best, I suppose. Um, Absolutely. Now, tell us about Tom. What are you doing in downtime, Tom? Because you're pretty you're pretty busy with training. So what what do you do outside of pool? Because I know it's important, and I tell my athletes that that when you're training, it's training. But outside of pool, you've got to have an other interest outside of pool. So what are you doing in your, in your downtime, Tom? I just like to, you know, living on the Gold Coast, go to the beach. Um, I'm a very keen surfer, so I like to go out and catch a couple of waves on my surfboard. Um, I'm really interested in coaching. That's really what my um, next career um, after my swimming career or being an athlete will be. So I'm, I'm really enjoying um, at the moment just doing some research on um, coaching, psychology, physiology, all those types of things. So, um, you know, just keeping – Keeping busy and just enjoying everything that it has to offer. I, I recently just got engaged um, to my fiance Jess, so just enjoying enjoying life really. Good, good, good. Congratulations, Tom. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure you're a very lucky man. I'm not sure about her though. <laughs> um, now, yeah. tell us about now. It's probably common knowledge now. Your career um, suffered a, a hiccup. Was it 2016 with the drug saga? I, I don't know much about it. I know that you missed three drug tests. Tell us yep. uh, what actually happened. And one of my questions, one of my swimmers, 
what did you do in the, in the year that you got suspended for? Can you give us the rundown what happened? So after the 2016 Olympics, I went on vacation and we have this thing called, um, I'm not too sure if, if you guys in India are on it, but um, we have the Adam system. So it's called the whereabouts where you have to, you know, yeah, yeah, log your daily routines, yeah. log your, where you're going to sleep at night. And you also have to yeah. provide one hour time slot every day, which drug testers can randomly come in and test you for um, substances that might be banned. And um, unfortunately, in my situation, in my case, I miss three drug tests, random drug tests in the space of 12 months, and you can't miss more than three. Um, so I was um, suspended for 12 months in 2017. There was no positive sample or I didn't test positive for drugs or anything. It was a um, it was a violation of um, missing three random drug tests. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's essentially what happened. There was no um, banned substance involved. It was um, it was a violation which I unfortunately served a twelve month um, ineligibility to race and um, train and compete. So, what made you? Um, how did you spend those twelve months and? and yeah, coming to um, yeah, Olympic year in two, in 2020, um, 2018, was come off game recording on it, yes. Um, how did you spend that 12 months um, to stay motivated, you know, psychologically and also physically? Um, to be honest, it was probably, it was a good time for me to take a break from the sport and just really evaluate whether I wanted to continue or not. Um, it got to a... I, I took about four or five months off and then I decided um, that I wanted to get back into the pool and, and train. But unfortunately, I couldn't, I couldn't train with any accredited coach or any program um, in the world. So I had to do all that six months of training on my own. Yep. Um, but what really drove me was I just wanted to, it came back to my goal before was I really wanted to be a part of and help that, that four by two freestyle relay team for Australia get on top of the, the dais next year um, at the Olympics in Tokyo. So I think when you have a goal, and, and this is why goal setting and having a purpose is so important, that when you have a goal and you have a purpose, it outweighs any bad or negativity that might might come in. And I think I'm a big believer in that, you know, the tough times do not last, only tough people do. Um, so that was a really big... Um, you know, motivated for me was that I knew the tough times weren't going to last forever. And yep. my why and my purpose was um, far bigger than any obstacle that I, that I, that was going to face and um, come up against. Yep. Yep. You made a really good point there, Tom. Yeah. Tough times don't last forever. There's always, you know, ways to, um, ways to look at next goals. Yeah. And you just got to you know, regroup and refocus and get that new goal you want to achieve. And, yeah, close that book on that chapter of your life and move on to the next chapter. 2018, Tom, very good year for you. Um, you came back with vengeance. Tell us about 2018. Yeah, so 2018 was was uh, was a good and a not so good year because at the start of the year I was obviously still suspended until April. <clears throat> so um, I slowly built through that year, and at the 2018 World Short Course Championships, I ended up picking up a silver medal in the in the 400 individual medley, which was a great result. Um, after you know facing some adversity and um, you know just all that hard work of you know a lot of swimming is already tough on on its own, and and to do it on your own with no coach and no teammates was was even harder. <laughs> so for me, that just proved that. If you do have a goal and you do have a purpose, the the goal at the end is definitely worth it, and that's what I achieved. I wanted to get back on on the podium that year and reestablish myself, and um, I did that in 2018. And 2019 was also um, a very good year. Yeah, it's good. I know you've had an outstanding you know, last two years, Tom, and yeah, you know, knowing you like I know you, I know you're a very driven athlete, and yeah, you know, it's great you're having all all this success. Now, being a named swimmer, from, from being a named swimmer now, having a reputation as a world-class I am swimmer to the first off, what's the difference now from Tom Fraser Holmes 
in 2016 from Tom Fraser Homewood and Nigel Nobody in 2010. Is the pressure different? I think it's <clears throat> it's a li- difference probably you know a good word to do, probably describe it it's it's not good or bad i think it's just how you deal with it and how you look at it it's you know the perspective that you want to look at it you can look at it and <clears throat> think that everyone's got a target on my back and kind of let the pressure you know weigh on your shoulders and then you know you just kind of crumble or you can just you know stick to your your processes and your routine and your training and um i think that's what i what i sort of did i think you know, I don't consider myself a name at all. I just consider myself as Tom, you know, who happens to swim, you know, some laps faster than other people. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, I don't feel like I'm probably in Australia. Like I, I feel maybe I'm the one to beat, but um, in saying that once I dive in the pool, it's not, it's not about anyone else. It's about me. Um, especially when I dive into race. And I think that just all, that just takes care of itself. Yep, I agree 100%, Tom. I think you only can control what, what you can control and you can't control what others control. Um, and um, also, um, as I tell my swimmers, when someone walks out the next time on extra leg, well, then you start worrying about them. But until then, they're just <laughs> another person at a race and they do the best you can. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> very true. Now, tell us about. Um, yeah, I think I'm a bit of a pussy cat when it comes to coaching. I'm very much a softy, as you know. Um, tell us about the hardest IM set you, you you do and the hardest freestyle set you you do. Well, which which kind of reminisces with you? Hmm. I know freestyle set we used to do. Um, probably short rest was. Every year, me and Dennis used to just come in on Christmas Eve and do 100 100s. And yep. 80 of those would be on 110 or faster in long course. Yep. Um, the medley one would have to be um, 12 400s IM. I think they were on five minutes, 455, 450. And then the last, the 12th one was a stand up time trial. That was pretty hard, um, but yeah. we do a lot of. We used to do a lot of sets, you know, yeah. like eight fifties dive on two minutes, all out. You know, that was I found that really hard. Doesn't sound too difficult, but that was really difficult. Um, we used to do this set, three fifties dive, maximum on a minute thirty, and then into seven fifties on fifty at um, best pace average. I think we did that set a couple of times when you were there from memory. Um, yep. That was always, a, that was a pretty tough set. We do that three yep. or four yep. times. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So that A150 is on two minutes time. I'm probably talking just to my swimmers now because we're talking in swimming terms. A150 is on two minutes. What time are you holding for them roughly? Do you remember? Oh, no. I meant 850s. So just 850, not 150, yep. sorry. So, so, so what time are you holding for them? Probably my goal was to be about a second under what I would like to go out in the 200. So that was 23 low. If I go around 23.5 yeah. to 23.2, 23, that yeah. was really good. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what do you find harder? Um, you know, you've had two world-renowned coaches in, in Australia. I know Dennis Cottrell and Michael Bowl. What do you yeah. find harder? The short rest sets or the descending sets or the quality? Um, I would probably find the quality sets just a little bit more harder than aerobic ones because I've obviously built up such an aerobic tolerance with Dennis <clears throat> that the aerobic stuff is yep. kind of a little bit easier. Just the, the quality stuff and, and the anaerobic yep. uh, maximum um, stuff is, is I find a little bit more challenging. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I asked, actually, when you said 100 hundreds on, um, on 110, I remember Dennis and I discussed that and how you guys took it as a personal challenge to get it done. I mean, there's not many squads in the world would do 100 hundreds on 110. Um, it's a pretty intense yeah. set, but you guys seem to um, 
um, find that as a challenge yeah. and really you, you kind of split each other on and yeah, it's something which I kind of implemented in my program with Leah, as you know, uh, she used to do 100, 100 on, one, on 120 and that, w- that was hard yeah. for her. But it's more mental challenge, more than physical challenge sometimes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, I think that's part of swimming. Now, how much how much iron work, kick work do you do, Tom? I mean, this thing which has really intrigued me because I kind of, yeah, I'm kind of, I know kick's really important, but what's your view on iron kick work? I, if we do, I like to alter, alternate the, so if we do on a Tuesday morning, we do freestyle kick, and then on the Thursday morning, we would do iron yep. kick. So I just basically rotate the sessions. Yep. We normally like to do um, like a Tuesday morning. Yep. I know with Dennis, we'd go 2K kick every Tuesday morning and that'd be freestyle. And then on the Thursday morning, we would do another 2K, two kilometer yep. kick set, which would be mixed up between flyback, rest and free. So just rotating those, yeah, so those I've sets. I've seen some of the, the uh, I've been there for some of the world sets. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're quite interesting. Dennis's kick sets are very interesting, that's for sure. Now, um, yeah. <laughs> if you want to swim a time, um, if you want to swim a time, what other sport would, do, would, you, th- would you like to be good at? Um, I was actually, growing up, I was quite a good rugby player, rugby union. Um, yep. So I don't think if yep. I was swimming, I'd probably be playing rugby union or rugby league. Yeah. Which is quite big here in Australia. It's kind of like... I think you chose the better sport, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably, yeah, yeah. I know cricket's really big in India. Um, as you know, rugby league's pretty pretty big in Queensland. So um, it's a pretty popular sport. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, favourite meal? Uh, favourite meal? or oh, My fiancé, Jess, is Swedish. So she cooks some really, really good Swedish meatballs. So that's probably my favourite meal. <laughs> Nice, nice, nice. Now, being um, you've been in this sport a long time, Tom. Um, and I'm not not picking age because you're an old man at 28 years of age. Um, <laughs> do you still get nervous? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I I still get nervous before some of our main sets. You know, I think if you don't get nervous and you know about anything or about something that you that you're doing, I don't think you're really passionate about it. Um, I, you know, I still get, yeah, I get nervous whether it's a state Queensland title or if it's a, you know, an Olympic trials or an Olympic final. So, um, but I think it's just being able to handle those nerves is probably the most important thing. Yeah, yeah correct. It's good nerves and bad, and bad nerves. You've got to really enjoy the good nerves. It's good to be excited. It's good to be apprehensive but then you got to learn to control it as well absolutely you know it's good to have nerves but it's not good if they overpower you and, and get the better of you now one of my swimmers just texted me a question right um in your opinion what's the secret of a good two and a three and a good four and a three i think it's good it's it's a combination of having a really good background of conditioning but I also really believe it's you, there? you have. Yeah, Tom? can you hear me? Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, uh, just answering your question. I think to swim, to be able to swim a really good two hundred and four hundred, I think you really have to be able to to be conditioned aerobically, um, and you also really have to be able to, you know, produce speed um, these days. In the two meter freestyle, yeah. yeah. So are you there? You keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just dropped that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Even a four and a freestyle today, it's not really a middle distance, but it's more a sprint of it, isn't it? It's a long sprint. Yeah, you know, two hundred meter freestyle, two hundred meter freestyle, and four hundred meter freestyle is a long sprint. And I like to think of that as yeah. the two hundred medley and the yeah. four hundred medley it as well. Is. They're it both. Is. So they're both very sprint dominated. Okay. Tom, we're nearly out of time, mate. I just want to thank you on behalf of myself and Glenmark Group for, for giving us up your time today. 
Uh, we wish you every success uh, leading the next uh, Peter, year. Peter, uh, Peter. There are a couple of questions in chat. Yep. Can I just read them yep. out? Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, Tom. Just sorry for interrupting. I can't interrupt. see so, him, uh, can you... yeah, No okay. problem. I, I'll, I'll go back. Okay. So, uh, there's a, so the first question is, how do you connect rack training set on a daily basis to the outcomes you expect in the meet? Can you give some examples in the form of timings? Um, can you explain rack training? Just clarify that. Okay. okay. How do you how do you connect daily daily, daily training time to how you want to compete? Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks for the question. I I really try and be specific in what I'm doing. So if I need to say, for example, my goal time for the two hundred meter freestyle is twenty seven zero for the middle two fifties. I really need to be 26-0 in training to, to replicate that in a race. And I need to be uh, to prove to myself and to get that confidence, I need to be able to do that as many times as I possibly can, but not swimming at a maximal okay. speed. Next, next question. Okay, uh, I've got 4,000 questions coming through, Tom, so I'll, I'll go through them quickly, right? Um, yep. Now, here's a funny question. Did you get a break in the 100 hundreds? No. <laughs> this you, at, at the end. You don't realise the intensity. Yeah, at the end, yeah, you don't realise the intensity. Of Dennis Cotter, I'm actually a pussycat compared to Dennis. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one now, question here. Yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 Go on, Peter. Okay. Now, um, in a meet between now and then, like when you're a youngster, right? And this is probably. Um, probably more relevant than an age group swimmer to compare to Olympian. I know Hacky used to tell me that he only wants to swim fast every four years. That's Olympic Games. Um, yep. How much did you, how much are your expectations on yourself now being an open class, world class swimmer compared how much you want to improve as a youngster? Oh, I think, um, you know, when you're young, I think it's just important to turn up, like I said before, turn up the training and you'll see those gradual improvements just by attendance. I think when you get a little bit older and you get to that high high performance level, you really got to be specific in your taper and your training to peak at the right time. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Now, you and I discussed, um, I discussed this a lot with my team about mirroring how you train and how you compete. Do you want to explain that in probably more swimming terms? So I like to come back to the word specificity. And I think <clears throat> that's, that's a huge part of, you know, you're not going to all of a sudden, if you're not putting the work in at training and you're not hitting the times, the training times you want to do at training, you're not going to rock up on race day and, you know, sprinkle a bit of fairy dust. And then all of a sudden this great result is going to be produced. I think, you need to train to race, not train to train. I'm a big believer in that. Um, yep. oh, still got me? Yeah, I got you. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, cool. Good. Now, um, next question is, uh, what do you do with your nerves behind the starting block? For me, when I was a bit younger, when I when I got nervous, I like to put music in. Um, but now, as I get a little bit older, I just like to breathe, and just that positive self confidence, self talk. How many times I've done this? How many times I've you know swam a two hundred meter freestyle in training or a four hundred individual medley? And I just really try to bring it back to enjoying it. You know, I think if you take it too seriously, you might you know you get more nervous. But if you just really enjoy it then I think that helps a lot. Yeah, true. Now, um, this is something which I've probably touched with my guys as well and probably numerous programs throughout the world. Um, you've got to have specified goals where you want to swim uh, at certain meets. You want to achieve certain goals at certain meets. doesn't mean you have to do a PB. Maybe you want to ex ex uh, execute your turns banner or work your front end of your IM, right? Can you break down on how you go about your uh, racing schedule at individual meets? As my race strategy? Yeah, no, as in, as in, do you target different meets to achieve different goals? Like, I want to work my turns oh. at this meet, or I want to do the first time I am, yep. whatever. 
Yep, absolutely. You know, there's always a goal behind every in-season meet and the big meet. You know, at a, at a Queensland State Championships, <clears throat> that's usually the first season of the meet for us. So we try and go in and, and really get a baseline of where we're at and then take those baselines to the next meet and say, hey, we just want to work in on our in and out speed on our turns. And then the next, next meet, it might be, we need to really push that front end and then so forth and so forth, just working up to that major meet. Very, very, very true, Tom. And also, when you get um, higher up on the pointy end of swimming, you're not going to swim massive PBs. And that's something which you've got to really understand as an athlete, that the process takes a bit longer as you get more to the pointy end. Absolutely. I, I, haven't, I haven't swam a PB in four years. But I've yeah. been very close, but I, I, haven't been, I haven't swam a PB in four years. So that doesn't deter me, deter me one bit. I'm still try, striving every single day to get that PB. Fantastic. Tom, it's, uh, we ran out of questions and out of time also. Uh, um, I want to thank you again on behalf of um, Glenmark. Yeah, one last question. One okay, last I question. I can't see it. BJ, which one is it? Yeah, is top, it? Three corrections, uh, top three corrections in your career which created a major impact and at what age? Top three, what was that? Sorry, I'm just reading it. Top three corrections in your career, which you made in your life, which you made in your career. Um, which career? In terms of the stroke or in terms of what's the correction there? I think, I think swimming-wise, the top three things in your career, which has changed the Tom, Tom Fraser Holmes outlook. I think just the first thing, probably just getting the technical skill aspect down in my in all four of my strokes i think the second one would be learning how to train and the third one is um learning how to recover from that training i think they're the three biggest things that that i've learned through my career um just from a from a technical point being able to swim with efficiency and then the next thing is learning how to train like someone who wants to win and then the third one is obviously you have to recover from that that tough session. I think one more question, Tom, before you go, right? And then we'll, we'll, we'll cut our conversation off. I think a lot of swimmers finish training, especially in my program here, they go back home and they start worrying about how they went in that session. You've got to learn to switch off after the pool. You're not going to have, not every session is going to be great and not every session is going to be bad. So it's something which you've been a, a class out you are. Can you just explain to me how you, you know, you obviously have great sessions and bad sessions. How do you, how do you change your, your, your mindset? I think I learned this from a very young age when I was at the AIS. And I learned no matter if it was a good session or a bad session, that I, had, I could not walk out of the pool. I couldn't walk out of the complex thinking about that session. Whether it was a good one or a bad one, I had to leave it there. And then when I came back for the next session, that's when I could pick it back up and then think about it again. So you weren't going around to your daily days, daily stuff, thinking about whether it was a good session or a bad session. You just got on with life. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, I'm getting like 9,000 messages through my screen here saying thank you very much. We're going to have to cut it off now because it's getting a bit later for us. Um, I just want to thank, thank you. you on behalf of Glenmark and my team and all the other coaches in the different centres. Uh, we wish you all the best for next year. We wish you all the best of, with the upcoming, uh, upcoming marriage. I feel sorry for poor Jess, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and I want to thank you again for your time. I've had the, I've had the privilege of, of training you for short periods of time. It's always been enjoyable. It's always been a challenge, but it's always been good fun. Thanks again, Tom. Awesome, Pete. Thanks so much for having me. And VJ, thanks for setting this up. Uh, all thank the best. So good luck. Have fun. Train hard.